Okay, so last time we look at the Gibbs free energy and the main conclusion from Monday was that the chemical potential is equal to the Gibbs free energy per particle. So now we're gonna look at phase transformations. Um, often they're also called phase transitions. The difference between a phase transition and a phase transformation, not that it matters in practice, but if you wanna go with the definitions, a phase transition depends only on the free energy. So it's completely thermodynamic. And a phase transformation also includes uh, kinetics, which we really haven't seen in this course, uh, but it's essentially some extra kinetic energy that you have in addition to your thermodynamic potential. And so they might uh, go between uh, metastable states, for example, your system. So without this extra kinetic energy, they could not go from one to the other. For example, if you have like a um, glass transition, glass to crystal transition, there'll be a transformation. Um, otherwise, you know, it's just a transformation. All right. So we're going to look at uh, single substances water, for example, um, helium, any other liquid, it consists only of one kind of particles. But the system is going to be in two, um, or actually it's possible to be in three different states, in, in three different phases. So what is a phase? Something like, I guess uh, we know solid, liquid, Yes. How do we call this in the case of uh, water? What is the solid version of water? How do we call it? Maybe you have ice. Awesome. The liquid? Water. Great. You guys are paying attention. What about the gas? A vapor. Vapor. What about uh, steam? Is that also a name for um, gas water? Yes. Steel vapor? Yeah. So steam, uh, would you use that word for something that is not water? Like, I don't know, mercury or something? Would it be for steam would be for between liquid and more gas and electric? Steam will be, you'll have both liquid and water. Yeah. I mean, both liquid and, and uh, both gas. Liquid and gas. Yep. So that's what the definition of vapor. So when you have a, let me confirm that. Yes, sorry, uh, vapor is when you have gas and liquid or solid in the same um, medium, okay? So these are called phases. What is a phase? How will you define that? A 
matter. It's a state of matter, yeah. But what is the difference between solid and liquid, for example? Yeah, you can you can change the the phase by adjusting the temperature and pressure. But what does make the solid and liquid qualitatively different? So it's an arrangement of the molecules. Good. So solid, I don't know, maybe we will have like they have some fixed structure. And maybe for the liquid, they're kind of, you know, they're everywhere, right? Can we have different faces that are both in the solid state? Yeah. I guess that would be the case. If you can have. Because if you have a uh, specific structure and structure where it exists both of the solid and liquid. Yeah, but what can you have two solid faces that are different? That have a different arrangement of atoms? Well, close to the liquid uh, pressure and one to very deep to the solid pressure. Yeah, that could be. So, um, water, for example, you know, the solid phase is ice. How, uh, how many kinds of ice do we know? Dry ice is uh, carbon dioxide. So, water ice. How many? Uh, structures that we know of. Any idea? There's a lot. Okay, so if you look at the face um, diagram, you know, a pressure versus volume diagram. Uh, actually, let's put this one temperature. Um, this is a phase diagram. So a different temperature and different uh, pressure, you're going to have a different arrangement of matter. So for water, it is going to look um, it's a little bit like this. So this will be, you know, close to zero Kelvin. This will be, you can see maybe this is like 500 Kelvin, so 600 Kelvin. Um, this one we can make it uh, logarithmic so that we can show more stuff. Actually, we can do that later. Let's first look here at one atmosphere. So if you have, uh, if you're at one atmosphere, so like in your house right now, as you increase the temperature from zero Kelvin, you know, going higher, you're going to have a phase transition here and another one here. So, at what temperature will this phase transition occur, the first one? And what phase transition is it? Which phase transition? This one over here. I don't see anything. Think about it. Are you moving? Like Okay, I think my screen is frozen. I think it's frozen. I can't see anything in it. Oops. Uh, 
Can you see it now? Yes, so can see it now. This point. So what phase is this over here in the low temperature range? Solid. Okay, so what about here in the intermediate temperature range? That's solid to gas? Over here. Well, this one is the liquid. This one is the gas. So if you are, okay, let me try to fix this. Something's going on here. Okay. Let's see that this works better. Okay, so again, this is the our phase diagram. Uh, we have one atmosphere over here. This uh, this is a pressure versus temperature phase diagram. In the low temperature part of it. We have the solid uh, that is going to happen pretty much with every material. Uh, in between, we have this liquid phase. This is for water. And as you, if you continue increasing the temperature, you get to you get to the gas phase. So at one atmosphere, which is uh, what we live in, this phase transition will occur at zero Kelvin. I mean zero Celsius. So 273 Kelvin. And this one from liquid to gas will occur at 100 Celsius, so 373 Kelvin. So if you go to another planet, I don't know about Mars because Mars has a very low atmosphere, but let's say, um, maybe like Titan or something, uh, in which you have half the atmospheric pressure that you have on Earth, what will happen over there? Well, it will take a higher pressure, I mean a higher temperature, to uh, go from the solid to the liquid, and the liquid range, the temperature range, will be much smaller. If you go to a place like Mars, or you know, more dramatically, maybe like the moon, but let's say I think Mars is already 1% of the atmosphere of the Earth. Then uh, over there, you cannot have a liquid phase. Okay? So if the temperature is low enough, it is going to be a solid. And if you increase the temperature, it will just become um, a gas. Okay? 
Mount Everest? Oh yeah, it, it will definitely happen. I don't think it's that dramatic, but yeah, you know, the it's atmospheric it's pressure. Yes, definitely. So you need higher, um, a higher temperature. Although um, this is not a typical phase diagram, water is not a typical substance. Uh, so we will see that uh, because what about the triple point? There is a triple point. Yes. So this one over here is called the triple point. But this slope for most materials is going to be positive. It's going to go like that, or it's going to be pretty vertical. But uh, water, because the solid is less dense than the liquid, it has this negative slope over here. And that's why you need a higher temperature to boil at a lower pressure. For most materials, higher pressure means um, higher temperature. And the other feature that is important over here is the critical point. Um, so if you go to from solid to gas, it's called uh, sublimation, right? So uh, yeah, in, in Mars you cannot have liquid water. Uh, we I guess pretty difficult to find. So over here at the triple point, the three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, coexist. You have all three at the same time. So the triple point is pretty, it's pretty special. But you also have these surfaces over here. So along these lines, this one and this one, you have two phases coexisting. So on this line, you're going to have solid liquid. Over here, you're going to have solid, um, solid gas. And over here, you have liquid gas. So this critical point over here, notice that I didn't continue drawing the line up here. And that is because there is no distinction between the liquid and the gas anymore. Um, you cannot liquefy the gas if you are over a certain temperature and pressure. So if you do not see a, a difference between the liquid and the gas, what makes a difference? You know, if you're, if you're doing an experiment, how do you know that you go from the liquid to the gas if you cannot see into the chamber? Physically, look at everything. Look easy around the table. Look easy. Uh, yeah, we can we can explain that with the equation that we're going to derive. So between phases, you're going to have a latent heat. So if you uh, if you have a if you have some ice and you provide some heat, then the temperature is going to increase pretty much you know, linearly with the amount of, uh, of heat that you provide. But then you'll have to continue putting heat in there and the temperature is not going to change anymore. So you're gonna have this peak. Um, and then so this will be your Uh, heat and temperature. And then, you know, from the liquid, it will also continue going up like this. And then you're going to have another peak, which is from liquid to gas. And this is very convenient, right? It means that you can cook, for example. So you can uh, keep your, your, your food at the same temperature when you're boiling because of this latent heat. All right, so all these concepts are pretty um, intuitive. You probably have seen them in like elementary school or something. So now we're going to um, derive some equations to describe them. But first, so this is one kind of phase transition from solid to liquid, from liquid to gas. 
what other phase transitions do you know of in which you have a um, qualitative, but also, you know, something measurable, also quantitative change in the phases? So I was mentioning, um, I was talking about the phases of solid ice. So if you go to like really high pressures, let's say that you know, over here is like one million atmospheres, something like that, maybe 10 million. Over here, you'll have to start to see, I don't know the phase diagram exactly, but maybe it's gonna look kind of like that. Different um, solid phases of, of water ice. So the structure, the arrangement of the molecules is going to be different as you increase the pressure. And they're called like you know, ice 10 and ice nine. You haven't? No. So if you go to like Neptune, for example, the, the, the water is not going to be crystallized in regular ice. It's going to be one of these more exotic, at least for us, more exotic phases uh, of ice. So this will be a solid, solid phase transition if you go from here to here. It is still a phase transition, but you can have many different, there's many different kinds of, um, of solid states. So you can have, I guess the most common um, arrangements of matter, like a BCC, body center cubic, in which you have The atoms look kind of like in the corners of a of a cube, and then you have another one in the middle, which is called body center cubic. One of the common ones. Um, another very common one is face center cubic. So you have your cube. You also have your atoms in the corners. So eight of them. And then you have uh, an atom on the surface of each of the faces of the cube. And this is called a uh, face center cubic. And you know, they can also, another very common one is called a, a hexagonal closed pact. So uh, you have like, you look like uh, hexagons on one side and then you have like something in between and then another um, layer of hexagons. And it's like this one, but displaced. So all of these are different phases. You can, you can measure, you know, you can get their X-ray diffraction. Um, for some of them, you can get a latent heat. So these are solid solid phase transitions. Uh, different kinds of phase transitions include for example um, this one might be the temperature axis and this is a system that is ferromagnetic at low temperature, right? So the spins are aligned. And then you have some critical temperature, TC. And we're here. Uh, so you have the disorder. Disorder spins. So maybe one over there. Right, and this is called critical temperature or the query temperature. So this is a phase transition there's another phase transition, for example, and uh, this would be composition. And over here you have a system that could be a conductor. So electrical conductor. 
and at some critical doping, it becomes a um, an insulator. If you're very close to this composition, then you might switch between electrical and between conductor and insulator using a voltage. And that is how the computer that you're using right now works. So it's a, it's a, it's a you know, very, um, a very well marked phase transition. It conducts uh, electricity or it doesn't. And you know, there's hundreds of different phase transitions. Um, and they are many of them are actively um, research in condensed matter physics and solid state. So, okay, good. Uh, that was an introduction. So now let's look again at this solid and liquid. Phases. The cool thing about you know phase transitions is that they have uh, a lot of things that are general that are common to them, even if they're very different. You know, like magnetism or superconductor to non-superconductor, they follow kind of the same uh, math. So one of the examples that we have over here. This is figure um, ten point one. Tell them, Tomer. So we have these three scenarios. So this is some sort of piston, you know, we can move it up and down. Um, in this phase over here, we're going to have only gas. Actually, it has some uh, large volume, so the pressure is probably kind of low. And then you compress over here, you decrease the volume, the pressure has to increase. And what's going to happen here? Uh, well, what George was mentioning, right? Um, I guess in this case is from gas to solid. So what you will see over here is a little bit of liquid and then some particles in the gas over here. So some of them will uh, become a liquid. If you go from, you know, if, it, if this is a very low temperature, for example, then it will go from, from gas to solid. And so you will see some ice over here. Um, and over here, I guess all of it became So pretty much everything that, um, that is part of the uh, our everyday experience is kind of going to be in one of these phases. So if you uh, pay close attention, you might see that um, if you leave a very small drop of water, you know just out on the table, it is going to evaporate. Uh, if you leave a bigger um, quantity of matter, then you know it might stay there for longer. It has to be in equilibrium with the vapor, so with the H2 molecules that are in our atmosphere. So the This is a different way of representing this information. So we've, before we have the pressure and the temperature, this is a pressure and, and volume. Okay, so the lines over here are isoterms. So 
So these are constant temperature lines, but you are changing, um, I guess you're modifying the, the volume, right? You change the volume, you change the pressure. So if the temperature is high enough, that this, was, this will always be uh, a gas. We saw it in the phase diagram. And so you know, this is a, kind of the uh, ideal gas behavior. But as you decrease the temperature, you might start to see this effect. So it might look, um, oops. there's like, like an inflection point over here, barely noticeable, and then it continues. But as you continue to decrease the temperature and repeat this experiment, what you will see is that there is a part here that is flat. Right? And this continues down here. And this flat range increases like this. So over here in the in the low volume part, uh, it's going to shoot up more quickly the longer this flat part is. Okay, so, so you can see it better. I'm going to draw it over here. And it will kind of like that. Okay. So if the temperature is low enough, so you know this isotherm might represent you know, 50 Celsius or something. Um, what you will see is that over here is a gas, so you can compress it kind of like a gas. Then you have this part in which you change the volume, but the pressure doesn't change. And then it's going to shoot up. So the liquid is um, it, you know it's a fluid also so in many ways it behaves like a gas but one of the differences between the gas and the liquid is that the liquid most of them are going to be uh, you cannot compress them and so if you change the volume just a little bit the pressure just you know, shoots up so you cannot continue compressing for you know, for a very big range, you need very uh, heavy equipment to do that. And you can see that this range over here, in which the pressure doesn't change when you change the volume, increases um, as the temperature goes lower and lower. So what is going on here in this range? Why is the pressure not changing? No guesses? Oh, it is in this range in which you, by pressing on it, you transform the gas into a liquid. So you can continue compressing. It is going to become a liquid. The liquid is going to exert less pressure than the gas. So you can continue compressing without changing the pressure while you are converting from gas to liquid. And then at this point, you converted all of it to liquid. And so it is much more difficult to compress. Okay, so at a sufficiently low temperature, you don't have this behavior. And at sufficiently low temperature, you always have this behavior. Okay, so what is the condition? Like how can we derive the, uh, the lines in a phase diagram?
Well, the system, if you look at it, it's in thermal equilibrium, right? So the, the gas molecules and the liquid molecules are going to be at the same temperature. They are in the same chamber. So they are in thermal contact. The gas molecules can become liquid molecules. And so they are in diffusive. Diffusive contact. And you can um, put more molecules over here in the liquid phase. That means that it will use up more volume and the gas will use up less volume. And so they are also in mechanical contact. If you can have both of them, both faces, and again, you know, this could be a gas and a solid, uh, then the chemical potentials have to be the same. So this one implies chemical potential of the liquid equals the chemical potential of the gas. This one implies that the pressure of the liquid is equal to the pressure of the gas. And this implies that the temperature of the liquid is equal to the temperature of the gas. Okay, so the, the coexistent curve is given by chemical potential of the liquid at some temperature and pressure is equal to the chemical potential of the gas at that same so let's call it T naught and P naught would be the same temperature and pressure. Okay, so this is equation 10.3. So this line over here that we're going to draw for the water look like that. So we're, we're deriving this equation, okay. the equation of this line. So if the chemical potential is equal uh, at this point, and you want to trace this, uh, this equation, then at some small if you change the temperature by a little bit and the pressure by a little bit on both sides, then that will also be, and so that gives you that slope over there. This is fine. So that means that the chemical potential of the gas, then we have pressure plus some small increment dp. And then we also have that for the temperature. Yeah, and it's called increment of the temperature. Then that is equal to the chemical potential is this one is liquid. Right. So if you remember the Taylor expansion, is given by F A F of A 
plus the derivative of the function a times uh, x minus a plus other stuff. So we're just going to go to first order over here. And we are going to expand about um, P and T, P not T not. So A is going to be P not and tau not. Okay, so then this one is going to look like Um, this part, so it will be the f of a, and then this one is the total derivative, right? We have two variables, so it's going to be a partial derivative, mu g, with respect to the pressure. Um, if we want to be more explicit over here. This mu is a function of p and tau. We want the total one. So first we take the partial derivative with respect to the pressure at constant temperature. And then we take the partial derivative of the temperature with constant pressure. This one over here, the uh, x minus a is going to be pressure. plus dp, so that is x um, minus the pressure. Okay, and we get the same thing for, uh, oops, there should be a plus over here. And we get another one here for the temperature. I'm not going to put that one over there. This one will be tau plus the tau minus tau. Okay, so this one goes away. This one goes away. We are going to have the same thing for the liquid. Okay, so we're going to have mu liquid and then derivative of the liquid with respect to the pressure at constant temperature. And we know that this is just going to be dp plus the derivative of the chemical potential of the liquid phase with respect to the temperature at constant pressure. And this is going to be just d tau. So this is the first term. This one is, I guess, the, on the right hand side. This one is on the, the one on the left hand side. And we know that the chemical potential have to be the same. So this one is equal to this one. And we can forget about them. And so this is our whole equation. So I'm going to um, write it again. I'm going to put it down over here. So <clears throat> partial derivative of the chemical potential of the gas phase with respect to the pressure at constant temperature, dp in tau.
tiny nano. Equals the liquid one. So we can just solve. For dp detail. So we have this term that is dp and this one too. So it's going to be partial derivative of the gas. With respect to the pressure, minus the partial derivative of the liquid. With respect to the pressure. This whole thing is multiplied by dp. We have the same thing for for d tau. So d p d tau. Just move this one over here. It's going to be whatever we have over here divided by this one. So it's going to be, I guess I'm just, let's see. That's fine. I need a little bit more space. So it's going to be dp d tau equals this one. Okay, so this is the slope that we were looking for in the phase diagram. Is the change in the pressure with respect to the to the temperature. So this is the this differential equation. This is the differential equation of the coexistence curve. Neat. But we can simplify that a little bit further because we know that the Gibbs free energy is equal to N times the chemical potential. The chemical potential, we saw that it was a function of the pressure and the temperature, it's one of the natural variables. There's no N. So you know, this implies that the chemical potential is G and P and tau divided by N. So the partial derivative, we saw this last time of the Gibbs free energy with respect to the pressure at constant number of particles and tau. What was this? The Gibbs free energy, derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to the pressure. Volume. This is the derivative. The derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to the temperature at constant N and pressure was equal to what? Uh, 
Entropy. Huh? Entropy. Right. Minus entropy. Yeah. So if we divide this quantity by one over n, then this is just the partial derivative of the chemical potential with respect to the pressure. And uh, it's what a nice surprise that we have over here. So this is the volume divided by n. So this is the specific volume, volume per particle. Same thing here. We divide by n. Now this is a chemical potential with respect to the temperature. What a nice surprise. So this is going to be minus specific entropy. So the entropy per particle. So, you know, now we'll, um, things are starting to look uh, better. So we're going to define two quantities. This specific volume, we're going to call it uh, lowercase v. And this specific entropy, we're going to call it lowercase s. So now we can rewrite this differential equation in terms of those variables. You get minus SL minus, minus SG. So that negative is important. Divided by VG, so the um, the volume per particle in the gas phase minus the volume per particle in the liquid phase. So just so that this looks pretty, let's change the order of this quantity. So it's going to be SG minus um, SL. So the specific entropy in the gas phase minus the specific entropy in the liquid phase. So this is the change in entropy when one, one molecule moves from the liquid to the gas. This is the change in volume, specific volume, I guess total volume also, when one molecule moves from the liquid phase to the gas phase. This is equation Ten point um, eleven. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, a little bit more a few more substitutions in here to make this equation. And this already looks pretty neat, but we can make it look even prettier. So if we multiply by tau on both sides, then what is a temperature times an entropy? Heat. Excellent. So this derivative times the temperature is going to be equal to this heat. This is the heat that it takes, that is required to move one particle from the liquid to the phase, I mean, to the gas phase. How do you call that kind of heat? If you remember your 2230 or whatever it is, it's the latent heat, we can call it L. So L, definition, is temperature times specific entropy of the gas phase minus the specific entropy of the liquid phase, latent heat. And then this change in volume, we can just call it delta P, and we can move this temperature over here, and 
we can draw a box around this one because it is an important one. So this is the equation that gives you the, the phase boundaries. It's called the Never spelled this one correctly. This is the uh, classes Clapeyron equation. Clashes, I think clashes is correct. Is more correct. Okay, so this is a famous equation, and it is. It's 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 actually pretty powerful. So if you think about it, it includes no, there's nothing specific about the, the, the material that you're looking at, the kind of molecule, uh, how the, what, what interactions does it have? It doesn't matter. So this equation is agnostic to Agnostic to microscopic details. Any physics theory that you come up with has to follow this rule, has to comply with it. So if your if your model, if, if the way you're modeling your interactions doesn't comply with this, then your theory is wrong. So these are my favorite equations. So this is equation, my, my favorite kind of equation. This is equation 10.5. This is why I think that thermodynamics is better than anything else. You know, um, quantum mechanics can come, um, electromagnetism can come and they have to comply with this. Okay, so there is a useful simplification of this equation. So the first simplification that we're going to do is say, well, um, the change in the volume, you know, which is equal to the specific change in the specific volume, which is equal to the change in the um, specific volume in the gas, gas phase minus the specific volume in the liquid phase. The specific volume in the gas phase is much larger than the specific volume in the liquid phase. So this is this delta V is approximately equal to just the, the specific volume in the gas phase. And um, another uh, simplification that we can make is that uh, this a fluid, whatever fluid you have in there, it behaves similar to a, to an ideal gas. And so the ideal gas law is that PV equals uh, N tau. So this one, if you remember, it was the whole volume in the gas phase divided by the number of particles. And so this has to be equal, this, it will be this volume. We have ideal gas behavior uh, will be equal to
Okay, it would be equal to Oh yeah, sorry, I was getting confused here. So this will be N B G. Okay, so now this will be N specific volume times the pressure equals N tau. And now we can cancel out the ends and so um, this VG is the pressure divided by tau and so DP dt is this latent heat and we're going to have tau and then this one is approximately equal to this one which is equal to this one so this will be pressure divided by tau um, wait Oh, temperature divided by pressure. Okay, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. Okay, now this works. So this would be L pressure divided by tau squared. So we can put, we can move this pressure over here. So we have one over pressure, derivative of the pressure with respect to tau equals the latent heat divided by tau squared. Um, I don't have much time, so. I'll move to the punchline. So this will be dp over p. We can integrate. This one will be, we can integrate our differential equation. This one will be dt dl. We can take it out as a constant if we assume that it's a constant. So that's another assumption of the this approximation. Tau squared. So you have your differential equation, you integrate on both sides and what you get is natural log of p over here, uh, L naught divided by t plus some constant of, of integration. So you do the exponent on both sides and you get the pressure as a function of the temperature. It's going to be equal to p naught, which will be the constant of integration exponent of minus the latent heat divided by the temperature. Okay, so these, you, know, you can measure everything. You can measure the pressure pretty well. You can measure the temperature. You can, um, you can fit this equation. So for water, if you do the lock of the pressure on this side, um, over here, one over tau, then you're going to get a straight line. 
over here you have in this region you have ice in this region you're going to have liquid and over here you have gas and over here you reach the critical the critical uh, point uh, so I guess here the temperature will be like 273 Kelvin. This is at one. Um, we're here 373. So what this tells you, what this equation gives you, this is called the vapor pressure equation. What this tells you is at any um, temperature, you're going to have, in this case, the ice phase is going to give you the pressure. So essentially, how many molecules of gas you're going to have in this case. And as you can imagine, like this would be a pretty low temperature. So the pressure, the vapor pressure is going to be really low. You're going to have very few molecules that are in the gas phase, but you're going to have more than zero molecules. This is necessary to maintain the equilibrium. As you increase the, the temperature, um, you know, at some point it's going to become a liquid and you're going to have many more gas particles and you need them in order to uh, again maintain the mechanical diffusive and thermal equilibrium so the number of molecules that you have in each phase is uniquely determined by this equation which i think is pretty incredible that you can have such information as you continue to increase the the temperature um, at some point, you are just going to have really, really hot gas. So this will be after the critical, the critical, um, the critical point. All right. So that's it for today. Thank you for your, your attention, and sorry for all the technical problems, but. Isn't this pretty neat?